All right, what's going on, guys? You're listening to WSOU. I am Nick, and I'm here with Mike McKinnis of Fight Amp. How are you doing? Good, man. How are you? Doing pretty good. Uh, so a lot of stuff has been going on with you guys. You've put out a lot of uh, new music lately. Uh, you have a brand new 7-inch that just came out not too long ago. Uh, yep. Uh, Keystone Noise 7-inch. Uh, so uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, that and what you guys wanted to do with it? Yeah, um, it's actually part of a series that Reptilian Records uh, is, has been releasing, uh, it's six, seven inches, um, over the course of, I guess, about a year and a half, and we're the fourth installment. So uh, Chris X, that owns Reptilian Records, is actually originally originally from Philly, but had a record store in Baltimore for years, all throughout the 90s. Okay. And um, when he moved back to Philly, he just wanted to scoop up some of the... Uh, some of the bands here that had a sound that were that was uh, conducive to his label. So he's just kind of showcasing some of the bands that are playing noise rock ish music. Uh, so yeah, we we thought we could have a good contribution to it, and we actually recorded the songs uh, in the sessions that we recorded our new album constantly off. So it's some of the same material as that stuff. Oh, okay. And that, that was what I was going to say, too. You guys just put off the Constantly Off EP not too long ago yeah. either. And the reception for it has been pretty pretty good. How have you guys been uh, feeling about that? About the reception itself? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been awesome. It's definitely been... We've been a band for a little while now, and it's our fourth album. And this the reception of this one has, you know, hands down been the best. And it's material we're most proud of, too, so... And does that kind of give you, you know, that extra kick to really go next to the next step when you guys go back into the studio? Yeah, I, I, no doubt about it. I mean, we talk about that a lot, how it's, you know, uh, consistency is a big thing. And we kind of lacked that a little bit, like in our lineup and stuff like that, whereas uh, myself and John, our bass player, uh, We've been there since the beginning, but we went through some lineup changes, and it was always happening in the middle of like writing records. So we would have a chemistry, and then we'd have to like deconstruct it and rebuild oh, okay. it again. Or this time, we've had a consistent lineup since 2011. Uh, it's been the same three people. So this entire, all the new material we've released has been, you know, from start to finish, from the first ideas all the way to recording and releasing the albums, has been the same people. So we finally built a chemistry that we feel like we can you know, finally identified our sound kind of exactly where we want it to be and then push it to the next level. And, you know, I mean, we're already writing now, so it's, okay. that's a lot of what we're talking about. Right. And I know you guys have been around for about 10 years now. So, I mean, how is it to just kind of keep moving and trying to find what it is? I mean, you said you, you finally kind of figured out exactly what you kind of want to go for. How does that kind of feel that you've, you know, been around for a little while and now you kind of, you know, there's almost that little bit of kind of confidence like yeah this is you know what we want to do this is how we're doing it yeah i mean it, it it has its pros and cons it's just one of those things where you know we're the type of people that want to be in the type of band that just kind of you know where we just set our own goals and play by our own rule book really and uh it you know it happens different for all bands some sometimes i mean i'm sure you're familiar there's plenty of bands that they crop up and within one year of starting you know, get some kind of like little sniff of commercial success. Right. Um, you know, they become, they get on like some kind of like something that's trending or a hype wave. And we weren't really one of those bands. I mean, we just, you know, we started when we were, I mean, you know, I'm 30 now and we started the band when I was 19. Wow. So yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's like, you know, when we started all we wanted, our only goals were, Hey, let's, you know, let's try to get a seven inch put out and go on some tours. And then yeah. after a couple of years, we're like, all right, people like us. Uh, let's try to, you know, go on a couple more tours and maybe put out an EP. It's never something where we had a long-term plan until 2008 when we put out our first full length is when it turned into something where we're like, okay, we can, maybe maybe we're a little bit more than a band that, uh, you know, is just part-time or whatever. Uh, but it definitely has its pros and cons. I just think that we kind of have gone back and forth with flirting with all different types of ways of doing things and really what we do is just what we think works best for us so right and do you think now since you know the reception has kind of picked up and you know people are taking notice and really liking what you're doing do you kind of feel like you have to meet certain expectations and maybe lose kind of what you thought 
you were going to do to try to keep up with where everyone is kind of guiding you? That's an interesting question. I mean, at, I can't speak for the other guys in my band 100% right. with this, but I know myself, like, I feel like we are operating uh, best when we are just identifying what our own goals are and not living up to anyone else's standards. Right. I mean, for a while there, you know, we, you know, we were under contract on a three record deal and we're not this, this album. We, I mean, it was, we took such a different approach with the new record and the seven inch on how we were doing things. And it's by far been the most rewarding just because we feel like we're kind of just taking a page out of a band like neurosis or the Melvins out of their playbook where it's just like you do, you do what works best for you. And we've had quite a bit of experience and we kind of realized that, you know, there's more than just getting in the van and, uh, you know, touring six months out of the year, uh, time and energy are also resources, just like, just like money is, just like touring is, just like putting out an album is, and you have to take a balanced approach if you want to have longevity, you know, if you want to be a band that, you know, puts out an album and gets some flash in the pan success, and then you kind of, you know, quickly come down the other side of the mountain, you know, I think you can really take any approach you want. There's no certain set of rules, but we now have, whether we like it or not, become a band that has had longevity and we have to, you know, approach it from a way that works for a band that does have longevity. So. Right. And I think that definitely has a lot to do with, you know, overall success of bands is the, the slow climb to the top instead of, you know, that first the album comes out and then you yeah. can never, you know, get back to that form that you were in. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. You know, like if we're always down to play by, you know, whatever rule book is going <laughs> to <you know, laughs> right. work, work best. And that's kind of by definition is playing by our own rule book because right. we're willing to adapt. And we, that is what we've done the entire time is just adapt over and over again to the current situation that we're in. And I think that that's, you know, if a bigger label came knocking and, and there were opportunities there, of course we'd entertain them. You know, we would never turn away anything that was industry driven. And at the same time, we never turn anything away that's, you know, DIY driven where we want to be a band that exists in all forms. Okay. So. And I wanted also your take on the whole, the way music is kind of delivered now, because you guys do put out, you know, a lot of vinyl. I saw you guys were doing cassettes and I, I saw a lot of feedback just on Facebook alone of people, you know, who are dying to get their hands on cassettes and, you know, yeah. seven inches in this day and age, you know, it's kind of different for stuff like that to be selling. And I wanted kind of your take on why you think that, you know, there's still that demand, you know, over the digital age and, how come you guys really are pushing to put your music out on in those kind of outlets? Well, there's, I mean, the answer is kind of multifaceted where, you know, A, um, I think that we're personally, we're vinyl collectors right. and we believe in physical formats. Um, you know, we, we it's, it's sort of a principled thing, first of all. But uh, second of all, you know, it is... It, at least in the scene that we're in, we, like we exist in a scene that is very both here in Philly and nationally and internationally that that also appreciates a physical product. Right. Um, so it's something we want to continue to support, and I think the people that like us are and come to our shows and and buy our records are people that you know they're collectors or people that believe in in you know continuing having um, you know physical releases. At the same time, you know why we put this new album out on every format, you know, digital CD cassette and vinyl is because people that like our band and like all types of bands, you know, I feel like we have, we're not just a vinyl band. There are plenty of people that just buy our digital and, you know, I mean, I'm a music consumer. I buy digital albums. I, uh, I buy vinyl, I buy cassettes. I don't really buy CDs anymore, but I still get a bunch of CDs, you know, when bands give them to me and I still listen to them. Right. So, we wanted to just, we want to have something for everybody. We just want our music to be available. So I like that a lot because yeah. it seems like the last few years, especially vinyl has really picked back up again. And I mean, not, I don't think it's that surprising, but I think it is kind of cool that all of a sudden, you know, everyone was like, oh, digital is going to take over everything. But yet, you know, vinyl is still pretty big. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it's had a resurgence. It never went anywhere. Right. And a lot of the resurgence is, you know, because there's a, a new demand for it that, you know, a lot of the, 
I don't really want to say major labels, but you know, a lot of major labels now, like they actually have independent subsidiaries, and they're the ones pumping out a lot of the vinyl. I mean, you hear about now all the all the backups at the pressing plants. A lot of it's coming from like strange, like old, you know, like uh, like movies, like the Wizard of Oz soundtrack on vinyl. You know, like that that type of stuff is getting pumped out now too, right. which is interesting. People are buying it, you know, and that's. I mean, I think overall. It's a double-edged sword, but I'd lean towards it being a really good thing that there's a resurgence in some kind of physical product. Uh, I just, you know, I can't help but think that having some kind of artifact for the art that you're consuming is is overall a good thing, you know? Right, and that's like my whole thing with as much as Spotify is a cool thing, you never really have, like, ownership of the music. It's never right. 100% yeah. yours, and that I, I've always kind of been one to have a copy of something so it's you owe it no matter what you have it yeah i you know i agree it, it, you could say the same thing for books and movies i mean all types of media it's you know there's digital options and then if for some reason that service goes away or whatever then suddenly you might be out some of those things that you always wanted to have access to right you know and i i mean that's kind of even as far as recording albums that's what you know if you read interviews from steve albini he talks about the main reason that he stays analog and recording the tape is so he he feels like if he was recording straight to digital, he'd be ripping the bands off because they wouldn't have an artifact for the money that they're spending on the recording time on that album. You oh, know? Okay. And I know because you guys, you said, you know, you do a lot of the DIY and getting out there. You guys have been playing a lot of shows. You guys did a whole East Coast run over the summer. And I see that you have a run up the West Coast in November. Uh, yeah. Now, what do you think is, is, is there a side of the country you like to tour more? Uh, no, uh, you know, it, it's just, what, we're from Philly, right. so we're, I mean, we're spoiled in the fact <laughs> that we can get in a van and play a week's worth of shows and, and do such a small amount of driving. Right. Uh, so it's easy to do that out here and we do it at least once a year, sometimes more, um, so it's a little tough sometimes to get out to the West Coast. We've done it, we've done it a bunch of times thus far, but this is the first time we're doing a fly out just because okay. you know there's a lot of stuff that happens in the middle of the country where there's a lot of awesome towns, but there's also a whole lot of empty space right. and it's you know logistically tough. So obviously the cities on the West Coast that we're playing in November are some of our favorite towns to play, and that's why we're doing a fly out. But there's cities everywhere that we love playing. Some of them are just harder to get to than others. Like Denver is a really good example. You know, that's a great town to play, but logistically kind of tough to get to and from, you know. Right. And also, I wanted to ask you, because I was looking at uh, the, your Facebook page, and under influences, it says foreclosed suburban ghost towns. And I wanted to know <laughs> what exactly that meant. Uh, I guess that's just a phrase that we're using, I mean, to kind of paint a picture of where we're from. I mean, we, you know, we grew up in the suburbs uh, of Philadelphia in South Jersey. And uh, John, our bass player, still lives there. Okay. Um, and, you know, there's just this thing in the suburbs that kind of, uh, I, I think, shines through in the sound of certain bands like us. And there were a lot of bands that were coming from, like, Northern Virginia, like Page 99 and Mannequin, and those bands that were from these, like, very suburban you know, these suburban towns that from the outside, like, look nice and quaint, but, you know, there's a whole lot of just weird, dark stuff that goes on in the suburbs. Uh, it's the, There's a strange sprawl that happens. There's no real identity. And, you know, I think in the current times, the suburbs are kind of dying. And it's just, you know, that's just where we're from. It's a way of painting that picture. You know, we're, we're from the those weird suburban areas originally, you know. Right. Okay. It's interesting. Yeah. I never really, because when I saw that, I was like, hmm, I wonder exactly what that means. But that that's actually a very interesting explanation. Yeah. I, I mean, especially in this day and age, that's what that's what's happened a lot in some <laughs> of those. You know, after the the banking crisis and everything, a lot of those suburban towns were foreclosed on. You know, right. and it, it it does leave these strange, boarded up homes in a lot of places that we're originally from. Well, uh, we'll wrap things up. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for doing this. Of course. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, that's really it, man. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you very much.